It is my pleasure to welcome Paul Katz to the podcast. Um, Paul, I typically ask my guests to introduce themselves, but I'm going to deviate uh, from my standard stuff as I like to jump around. I want to read, sure. and again, as I said to you before we record, I am incredibly humbled that I have you as a guest. So let me read uh, about you. Paul is a Grammy-nominated music industry executive. His portfolio includes Oscar-winning movies like Green Book, 12 Years a Slave, and American Factory. And you'll work with artists like Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, Pink, and Outkast. And there's a lot more for, for where that came from. But I think this is this is a good intro to start a beautiful conversation. And so what I typically do, Paul, is I want to run through a little bit of your childhood years so that we can then fast forward to how'd you wind up doing what you do so if we met did you grow up in are you british in england i did i grew up in i grew up in london yeah and just london. on the edge of london and the suburbs of london yeah perfect so if uh if if a young bloke like me ran into you when you were 15 16 and said paul what would you want to be when you grow up what was the answer uh, that actually strangely enough was uh was an easy answer for me music and I had, um, and first of all, thanks very much for having me. And uh, oh, it's I'm, my I'm pleasure. very appreciative. But it, it was music. Um, I knew from an early age of about 13 that I want, that I didn't have necessarily the chops, as they say, to be a really great musician, but I absolutely love music. And so from um, high school, undergraduate, postgraduate, law school, and even when I was training as a lawyer, because I remember your guest from last time, Peter, I think it was, said he didn't want to be a lawyer. I did end up one for a little while and then kind of switched. Um, <laughs> but but I, 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 was, I was, had my own kind of uh, DJ set up with equipment and would do parties and everything. And I had applied to EMI Records, which was the big English one, you know, the company with the Beatles and all those kind of folk, um, at least eight times by the time I was 16. And I would have just gone there in a heartbeat because I really, really wanted to do to do music. So I knew very, very early what I wanted to do. Hmm. So interestingly, I'm, I'm, I'll jump around. I'm going to tell you the, the story of my my own son, who uh -huh. uh, in in the middle school years in 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 New York was practicing literally three times a day. After he finished his homework, we had a basketball hoop in uh, uh, in the front of the house, and he practiced because he wanted to make the the junior varsity team at the high school. And he was a really good athlete, but he three hours a day getting ready for that day. The varsity uh, tryouts came on the junior varsity country. They only had, um, I think, one spot on the team. Uh -huh. And they didn't pick him. Uh, and this is six months of, of really intense training on his part. They picked someone else who happened to be the son of one of the board of education members so it was clearly a a politically motivated stupid decision which crushed mm -hmm. my son he did mm -hmm. not want to touch a basketball and incidentally as you know sometimes we say things happen for a reason in life he was discovered around the same time by his music teacher as a i'm not going to call him a prodigy musician but someone who had the chops as a saxophone player, and he came to us and he said, "You should get him a private teacher because because he is very talented." And he he moved his his passion from basketball to jazz, and was became a, a really really an amazing jazz musician. Uh, he's not he's not making money being a musician. Not no surprise to you, but that's so like yeah. my 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 side story. So. How did you go can from? I, can, if, I, if I might, might just say about your son, I think the important thing, and this is with my, I have two kids. They're, they're, they may be, um, well, one, one uh, Italian is 27 and Joris is 23. They both love music. I don't care. One of them is in, in the profession as a composer, Tal uh, Italiano, um, you know, composer for film, film and TV. But as long as they love it, it doesn't matter if it's music or whatever it is, as long as they have a passion. The difficulty, I think, is if you don't have a passion then you're stuck a little bit yeah and so when yeah. when and then he was trained by master musicians in the city some really phenomenal yeah. phenomenal internationally famed people and when we mm -hmm. applied for college uh, I remember he came to me and he said dad every one of my master teachers 
have told me this is a really difficult way to make a living. You're going to be starving before you make any money. Maybe I shouldn't go for music. Maybe I should do something else. And I looked at him and I said, Ilan, what does this mean to you, this, this jazz thing? And he said, everything that. And I said, then go be a musician. Don't be like 95% yeah. of people, including your own dad, who are working for a living, but are not really that happy about it. There's other things yeah. I would have wanted to do in life. And he did. He went to New England Conservatory in Boston. Oh, uh, fantastic. Yeah. He, he, yeah, he, he had great education. Now. He had great education. He wound up being a yeah. Fulbright scholar and was went to Korea on, I still don't understand the project of jazz and ancient, uh, you know. Yeah. And, and I, I, I still don't understand what he was doing, but uh, yeah. he still plays, he still practices, but it's not his primary uh, means of, of surviving. So, so Paul, yeah. you go from the love of music to being a lawyer. What happened? Well, it's it's interesting, you know. I basically um, was still DJing, and I went to law school. And uh, even even in my undergraduate, uh, postgraduate stuff, I was teaching a little bit. And but I was DJing, so I'd be out till four o'clock in the morning. I go. This is at London University. I go in and do a kind of a seminar, and uh, I'd be bleary eyed. And the kids who were much brighter than me, and I'm not just saying that; they were actually <laughs> much brighter. And be like, that's a great. Question, I'll come back to you next week. And I thought, this is not for me. But I wanted to, to qualify, at least, you know, um, because I, I think I come from a family where, where being a lawyer or a doctor, they were, they were, they were immigrants, uh, my grandparents, um, my great grandparents. And, you know, it was a, it was a safety thing in a way. Um, and so during my two years of, of, uh, of uh, articles, they call them in England, where you get paid very badly and you work for a law firm, I work for a big law firm doing entertainment law. Um, I still just wanted to do music. And so um, the day that I finished my two years and qualified as a lawyer, I'd passed the exams a couple of years before, I, I was going to go and bum around America. I'd been traveling around Europe, you know, doing the kind of the student thing and all that kind of stuff. And I'd never been to the, to the, to the, to the States. Um, and I saw that literally that day, a job at EMI Records um for a for a business affairs person which is a lawyer that does kind of the business deals mm -hmm. and so I thought oh this is you know karmic here go go for this one so I'd already quit my job because I knew obviously gonna, I was going to go travel and I saw this job in the in the London Times and I go for the interview and I knew nothing about the job whatsoever but I knew every band on that rock on the roster I knew every song and I and my first interview was with this guy Steve Fernie lovely guy I'm still still in touch with him off and on you know 35, 40 years later. And he asked me a question, who's better at business affairs, a lawyer or an accountant? And I went, um, actually, I think you could be a, a dustman or garbage, garbage man. As long as you've got common sense, that's what you need. And fortunately, he was neither an accountant or a lawyer. And so I managed to get through to the next level of interviews and I got the job. So the law thing got me into, into, the, into the job that I wanted. And so I was at EMI Records, which is where I really, really, really wanted to be during the period where we signed Duran Duran and Dex's Midnight Runners and lots of different bands. Um, and so I was there, was there for a couple, couple of years. So law was useful and it's still useful to me today in the other things that I do. Um, and also what's interesting, you know, you, you talk about your son being a jazz musician and he had models of people and possibilities. I think if I had known people who were in the human rights legal field, mm. because that's something that in my later life, the last 20 years, I've been very involved in, in kind of social justice and philanthropy as part of what I do, which we could get to later. I may have yeah. stayed in law, but I really, really, really wanted to do music. So uh, it's great that you, uh, that you were encouraging of, of your son. So that's yeah, how I got so, into the music business. Yeah. So, so at some point you wind up with uh, Jive Zumba, uh, yeah, right, yeah. it was, and yes. and that was founded by, you know, even, I think even I knew who Oliver Calder and Ralph Simon. Clive. And I'm not. Clive Cal Clive I'm sorry, Clive. Clive. Yeah, Clive. I'm yes. sorry. Um, yes. Two obviously mega personalities in the industry. You get to work with them. Um, yes. What was that like? Well, I'll tell you how I got there, which is kind of interesting. I, I, um, so I was at EMI for a couple of years 
um, and you know it was a really good entry point but it was a bit like the British civil service in those days very a little staid and you go off to um, go off to Hong Kong for two years and you go off to this country and I thought this I wanted to be more entrepreneurial and I didn't know and I was on the record side so that it, with, with music there's two sides that there's more but primarily it's a the record you make a recording or you do the writing of the of, of the music so if you took the song my way you know the frank sinatra song and the sex pistols song it's written by actually it's a french song called Comme d'habitude and paul anker did the english lyrics and it became my way i wanted to know about the music side so i got a, I, I got a job offer from me and my music publishing but i wanted somewhere smaller and more entrepreneurial and so i went from the fancy place in the west end of london to Wilston, which is um, a little less chic, should we say. And mm -hmm. I ended up working with Clive and Ralph, um, primarily. Um, initially, I went for this publishing job and Clive, after about two minutes, said, you don't know anything about publishing. I said, no, but I really want to learn and I want to work with you. And he said, said to me, I don't usually do this. I've never done this before in my career. And this was a company that was about 11, 12 people. He'd come from South Africa because he wanted to work in a bigger environment and he also was very anti-apartheid and did a whole lot of stuff in support of the uh, anti-apartheid movement um, and he said I'll take a shot on you and I ended up actually not working in music publishing to begin with I, I ended up representing record producers with Ralph so that we, we represented the people that, that like Mutt Lang who did ACDC and Iron Maiden and Def Leppard and so that's how I got my chops uh, as we say um, you know, in that world and understanding that. And then I moved over to more kind of a business, businessy role um, in Wilsdon. And for the next two or three years, I was there until 1985, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, I started, yeah. And basically, my Marie Christine, that's my wife, who's from the French part of Switzerland, um, has always been a traveler. You know, lived in, she lived in Israel for a year lived in Germany for a year, et cetera. And we were saying, maybe, it, you know, we didn't have kids or anything. And we said, maybe it's a good time and we, to go traveling. We've never been to America. Um, and we were away a weekend and we we're thinking maybe America, South America could be interesting. We're young, you know, this, we, we, we don't have a lot of kind of obligations. And that Sunday we, we got back from, from, from Bath for the weekend where we'd have this discussion. And Monday Clyde says, come over to the house, came over to the house, says, how would you like to go to America? to help build the business up. There were three or four people there, still my friends, the people I work with, worked with uh, in the States. Um, and I said, yes. And he said, don't you have to ask Marie Christine? I said, nah, she'd be fine. Because I knew, I knew the answer. So we, so after two years in London, I went over to the States for a year in 85 with Marie Christine. And here we are still, this is my uh, my home, my island between America and Europe, as I call it. Um, so, so, Cl yeah. so Clive sends you to the lines then of, of American music scene uh, to start to develop the business, which is incredibly <laughs> competitive. Yes, but, but I wouldn't say I was, you know, I was very fortunate. First of all, Clive had been, and Ralph had been working in in, uh, in the States for many years through a company called Arista, which was run by Clive oh, yeah. Davis, who's a, yep. a legend, you know, legend Whitney Houston and many, many, many other wonderful artists. And so, um, and then in addition, there were, um, three or four people who worked in in in, in the uh, in the u.s office there was barry weiss who ran the record label there was rochelle greenblatt there was ann carly um and so i was i was you know and while i didn't know them intimately in the sense of a day-to-day -day, um relationship we had worked together over the over the years and they welcomed i was family and in fact with barry which is really lovely uh my brother's married to his sister as a result of us meeting but 25 years later, so we're really family. Um, so they were very warm and welcoming. And the, the, I don't know about you, um, because I know that you're, you're obviously from, from Israel and you came over here for college, I think, if I re recall, mm -hmm. um, from, from reading the bio and all that stuff. Um, the difficulty I had was having a common language where you think you actually know people and you actually realize you do not know, you know, because somebody from... Um, I'm going to say the Bronx is different from Staten Island and New York is different from Nashville, where I where we, we did a lot of business or Los Angeles or just the whole scale of things is very big. You know, I didn't know country music or gospel music, for example. I just knew 
a pop song, Don't It Make Your Brown Eyes Blue, was a pop song to me. Mm -hmm. um, or Oh Happy Days, you know, it was, it was not a gospel song because there weren't those genres. So it was a lot to, le lot to learn, and I'm still learning, and I like learning, so that's, that's, that's important. Um, but I had a very warm and welcoming business-like Mm -hmm. um business-like situation but it was uh it was it was good it was, i think it was easier for me than marie christine because i came into a structure marie christine didn't come into a structure so it was a bit trickier for her but eventually but, but after a while she went to university over here and did her passion which was art and mm -hmm. which she still does today so it was it was a good entry point but it, yes very competitive business very difficult business um so so, so we, for go ahead i'm sorry no, I was just going to say what was very interesting and um, in terms of entrepreneurship, which I know a lot of your audience is, is interested mm -hmm. in, you know, we came over with the kind of, the, I wouldn't say the British invasion, but a little bit British invasion-ish. So a flock of seagulls, Billy Ocean, and, and my colleagues, this is Clive and Barry and Anne Carley, especially, really identified rap very early. And um, we got into rap really early um, with groups like uh, Tribe Called Quest, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, you know, that's Will Smith, Too Short. And so we went in a whole different direction and built this fantastic roster of artists. Some, some you know, I understand the misogynist stuff, some very political, but it was really a big thing. Um, and then that grew the business. So I, so I guess the point I'm making here is by being... Um, aware of the environment and what's going on in a cultural sense because culture has led a lot of what i do you can build businesses based based on that obviously there's tech as well but mm -hmm. for me the the um the edges going into the mainstream has been the big theme of, of what i've done in my uh, in my career and still do so you interestingly you mentioned rap um yeah. and and this is i mean this is your expertise rap is uniquely an American genre, right? That's copied around the world. Is it? I, I would say yes, in, gen in a general sense, yes. But yeah. there's a lot of rap that originates in France with like or Belgium with Strome or Nigeria with Afrobeat, but includes rap. Yes. But I think like jazz in a way or blues, it tends to have originated a lot from the from the US. Yeah. Yeah. And and look, um I love music and the fact that my son became a jazz musician, which is one of the things yeah. that I listened to for years before he got into it. And he didn't know that is yeah. great. But and, and speaking about rap, just uh, just as an aside, yeah. um, I don't think white people really get it. Right. And, and I'm, and I'm using the I'm gonna word. I'm going to challenge you on that. So I oh, would okay. say, Oh, I'd say, your, ahead, your generation may not, and my generation may not, and I would agree with that. Or they may get spoken word, the new Eurekan poets, um, you know, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of the poetry, spoken word poetry, you know, manifested itself in, in what is rap now. Um, mm. You know, that's that kind of tradition. But um, every kid, almost in America, suburban, doesn't matter if, it, if you're, you know, whichever race you are, they totally get it. And it could be anyone from, and I'll give you the bigger ones like Drake, but Little Baby, Moneybag, Yo, you know, Nicki Minaj, um, you know, Lorilla. Um, it's big, it's mainstream. It's not only mainstream, it is the predominant music genre by far, not just as rap yeah. or hip hop, but also as pop music. I mean, you have Taylor Swift and all that, but no yeah. it's 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 ubiquitous but what is it that 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 connects the younger generation through rap because to me and again this is not my area but um most of the the, the artists that that i see who rap the a lot of it comes from their own it's emotional it's their own upbringing it's what they went through which when i said a white guy doesn't get it we didn't grow up in inner city and live that life but you're saying that for the younger generation, they connect through it. What is it about rap that connects everybody then? What was a song that you liked when you were 18? Like, which was an artist or a song that you liked when you were 18? When I was 18? Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, I Listen, I, I, we're, we're going to date me, but I, I don't remember. Yeah. A Stairway to Heaven was one of my favorite. Okay. Led Zeppelin. All right. That was yes. my first concert I ever saw was Led Zeppelin. So it's a good choice. Yeah. You yeah. related to that lifestyle. 
maybe you weren't in that lifestyle, but you related to the song, you related to Robert Plant up on stage. Maybe, maybe there was a kind of a culture of often smoking weed and stuff, but there was a whole alternative kind of lifestyle. Mm. And, uh, and um, I think here it's a combination of, of, of things. And this might apply to music or, you, or, or, or of all genres, whether it's country or gospel, you relate to the lifestyle. You may not want to emulate it precisely, but there's a certain, there's definitely a, an infusion of that kind of hip hop, like uh, kind of chin, the sneakers and all that kind of stuff. But they're also talking about emotional states and um, um, experiences that you relate to as a human being. And so yeah. it's this, it, it just touches everybody in that way. Yeah. All right. So let me, let me, uh, I'm going to fast forward because I want to get to talk about uh, sure. your book and talk about uh, uh, yeah. other aspects. Um, just because, again, because this is an entrepreneurship. Yeah. The, the topic and the vibe of the show is entrepreneurship. You you spend your entire career in something that most of us don't get. So when I watch the Grammys, um, yeah. I, I see people who are nominated and people that perform. We have no idea what it takes for one of those artists to actually make it to the stage. Just like in my own small little word, world in in going with my son to every master class with some really really incredibly successful yeah. musicians i could see how long it took him literally hours of practice and and work we don't get that so from your perspective um what can we relate as entrepreneur to the type of wh what it takes for musicians to be successful because it's such a brutal business it is it is a di difficult business as are other businesses yeah. i think there's and i think of musicians often as creators of course but also they have to be marketers and they have to be small businesses in their own right so them as a musician i think you need some talent obviously you need character persistence you need great relationships and teams around you and you need a little bit of luck that's what i think and maybe yeah. that applies to small businesses as well um in, in the same way but it is very difficult and some people will you know a very small percentage will be the great ones that persist through generations like led zeppelin or perhaps a taylor swift or alicia keys you know really great songwriters or jay-z um, and others will be lower down on the pyramid will make a decent living and others will not make a great living and they'll have to supplement by doing other jobs it's it's like everybody else in in, 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 in any other business, I think, ultimately. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. Yeah. I, mean, I I I always kind of because I love comedy. I always when I go to comedy clubs and and you look at the uh -huh. comedy scene, I think it's yeah. kind of similar. You got to play the clubs everywhere. Got to be on the road three hundred sixty days a year, and then maybe one day somebody would discover you. But uh, you know the the probability is very low. But they love what they do, and that's you. Yeah. You pay your dues through it, right? Well, what's also changed an incredible amount recently in the music business is, and using the comedy analogy, comedy, you'd go and do the clubs. If you were really lucky, you get a TV series like uh, Everyone Loves Raymond, you get your HBO special like Chris Rock just did, and you'd be a, on an, S, an, an SNL. Now, you can be on TikTok or Instagram, you, you're your own creator, there's no you and a distributor that you need, mm. and you can just do do it and you can earn a lot of money and the book i should mention the book of course but it, it's called good influence how to engage yeah. influencers for purpose and profit and it deals a lot with social media creators as well as celebrities and how you can utilize them to grow your business or yeah. in my case i want it to be social impact businesses but it can apply to the business um that in music the same thing has happened that so you can go straight to spotify for a ten dollar fee to a distribution company um and in fact, you know, where in our day when we were growing up, there may be 30,000 records were released and you had to go through EMI or CBS, now Sony. Um, now you can just put it out yourself, unfortunately, mm -hmm. or fortunately, fortunately in a way, I think, is there's a, you know, maybe 30,000 tracks a day that go up there on Spotify. Yeah. So break, cutting through the clutter is the difficulty. Um, mm -hmm. And while you can be really talented, and I do think talent, breaks through you still need those other characteristics the marketing the persistence the character mm -hmm. the, the team around you so i think those are very similar to, to any small bit small business but it's very competitive yeah 
So when when was it in your career? Um, I'll, let me jump first to how you describe yourself, and then I'll come back to my question. So you describe yourself as a social entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, how would you explain that to a 10-year-old? Well, I wouldn't describe myself when I started off in this course. So, so just to connect the dots a little, little bit, I was at Zomba for 20 years. And in that time, it grew from 11, 12 people to maybe 2,000 people around the, around the world, record companies in different countries, music studios, music publishing, did very, very well and was sold in 2003. And Clive Calder was the entrepreneur who I'm really I'm still involved with in his philanthropy um, through El Elmer Philanthropies. Um, and it's just a wonderful person. Um, that when that was sold, I went over to BMG, Sony BMG, who bought the company for a couple of years, had a nice experience there, but it was a, it was a big company. I didn't really want to be, be there. And I mm -hmm. went back to um, Columbia University to teachers college. So I was very interested in children. If you can get them, it's kind of chaos there. If you get them young, you then can push them into a better place, you know, whether it's education or health or whatever. And I had this idea for a business. And so the fact that it was, um, I was very comfortable at Zomba. And so I didn't want to move. And I did a little bit of kind of philanthropy on the side. Um, but, but at one point, I had, or two points, I had two experiences where I thought, you know what, I'm not just sitting here and writing a check or being, you know, the, on the board of the Grammys or on the board of this, this nonprofit. I want to do something. And I like creating, you know, building up companies. I don't actually like kind of running them day to day, although of course mm -hmm. you have to as a small business person. Um, and so I, so I went back to, to you know, while I was working at BMG, I went back to Columbia for, for and, and, and um, did a lot with education. And then I started my own, my own business. And so if I look at it today, you know, 18 years later, I still have two parts. I still love music. It's never going to change. And so I'm involved with, can I go into this to give you your, your, your viewers a sense of this? Yeah, so yeah. so just to, to go yeah. back to my my first point, that's how you describe it. So my second was going yeah. to be, at which point in your life did you decide that philanthropy or social causes was really where you wanted to spend time? I guess you got the bug with Ed Zumba, right? By working I, with I, Clive. I, I, yeah, yeah, well, Clive was, was primarily music, but also did we did some philanthropy. I was also, um, you know, Music does a lot with philanthropy. Live Aid, I was at you know, in the eighties. Mm -hmm. Stop the violence with uh, with uh, BBP and Ann Carly, and all through my career, you know, TJ Martell, which is the industry um, nonprofit that deals with kind of cancer HIV research. With a friend of mine's son passed away, we all congregated and raised you know several hundred million dollars over the last twenty five years for cancer research. So there's always that going on. But I but I thought of myself. I'm not the type of guy who's going to go somewhere and build a house because I have no skills, but I can connect people. I can produce things. And so can I use the entertainment connections to do some good in the world? Because I saw the power of music and how it affects people emotionally, but it also has behavior change, political ramifications, cultural change. And so I, these days I still do music, and, but I have this agency called Entertain Impact, and we are a socially entrepreneurial agency. And so what does that mean? That means we work with, we, we look at with business people, we come from business, but we try and have a, all our stuff is social impact related, our clients and nonprofits, foundations, uh, some corporations who, who have social initiatives. Um, and what we're doing is we're trying to raise awareness, money, um, support, drive programs, get people to act. In our case, in relation to say a campaign for um, vaccine initiatives, preserving uh, Nina Simone's child at home to talk about culture and the black experience in America for the uh, for the um, the um, you know the particular nonprofit that we we work with. So it's the use of entertainment and popular culture for social change. That's the lens that I do it through. Okay, yeah. So so yeah. we can uh, using marketing terms, we can say that the entertainment piece is sort of like the hook to push the the social justice, the the philanthropy. Get, create the awareness that leads people to get involved right i think that's yes it's a it's it's basically you still need a good good campaign if you're a great singer and you have a bad song you have a great singer if you have a good yes. song and a great set you have a hit i want to have hits so you still need the underlying campaign but we which we do as well but you we we amplify everything so you're if i come and uh, come out on social media 
you know, certain people will know it. I don't have a big following. But if Ziggy Marley or Usher, who I work with, or Kevin Kevin Bacon or Angelique Kijot, who just won the Polar Prize in music, fantastic, well done. Um, they say something, people are going to pay, pay, pay attention to it. And if you, through your research, and we're very research orientated, you link with their audience, these desired audiences that are really difficult to find, you know, um, the kind of Gen Alpha, Gen, you know, Gen, Gen Z, uh, Millennials, et cetera, they're difficult for businesses to get to. But mm -hmm. these folk, if you have the right um, influencers, as I call them, who's credible you know, and real about it and passionate and the people we work with do not get paid. It's because we identify somebody who's in, interested in education or social, in criminal justice or whatever. You're going to reach those audiences. Um, so for us, it's very much the use of primarily um, individuals that fit with a campaign because they're passionate about it. And sometimes with movies, which is a much bigger lift. But we did a movie recently, but not recently, a few years ago um, called Coco, which was an animated movie about a kid that um, whose grand, great grandfather, grandfather was the Elvis of Tejana music, uh, but wasn't allowed any music in his home. And so that was a great thing to, to um, pair up with the Grammy uh, Music Education Coalition about the lack of music in public schools in America. And so, you know, it was a good fit. And so with the Nina Simone one that I mentioned, Campaign to Preserve a Childhood Home in Tryon, North Carolina, for the African American Cultural Heritage Edu Action Fund, um, you know, we went for people who love her music, who recorded her music, who liked her civil rights politics and approach. And we have people, anyone from um, John Legend to Cat Stevens, and then to people, you know, rappers, uh, musicians like her um to people like Miss, misty copeland you know the uh, the, the uh, principal dancer um mm. so as long as it's that kind of heart connection but with a kind of a strategy behind it um but always always with a social impact um at, at the yeah end, and that's the goal yeah and what we'll, i and i want to i'm going to move to influences very quickly because because yeah. that's that's important but again as a preview how the way you're describing how you use influencers yeah. to push to push causes. Uh, the key was not just to put a you know a, a Drake or Kevin Bacon or somebody famous on stage or use them. It's really understanding the the audience that can connect with them, right? That's that's really the the important piece. It's very important because um, let me give you an example. We did a thing for the American Diabetes Association called the Diabetes Dance Dare. So you danced, you dared three people, and then you could donate if you wanted, but it was much more of an awareness campaign. I wanted to be more donate and ask, but we, it was more awareness. And so we seeded that by doing research. We have people like Mark Cuban, Shaquille O'Neal, Usher. All of them have got uh, um, connections to diabetes. Mark Cuban and Shaq's dads have diabetes. Usher's son is a type 1 diabetic. So it was really heartfelt for them. And so we seeded that, and it really took off. We had Kelly Clarkson, for example, um, on the Today Show, nothing to do with us, it, with Kevin Hart being organic about it, you know, doing this dance, dance deck, Camilla, Camilla. It spread to six countries. We had tens of thousands of people involved. Um, we had um, a significant, you know, kind of um, a visibility through social media, over a billion impressions, much, much um, uh, press, traditional and, and online. And that's fantastic, but that's what I call tactical impact. I'm interested in that, but I'm also interested in what I call ultimate impact, which is, did we help reduce the rate of diabetes as part of the collective? We can never say we do that by ourselves. We have communication yeah. KPIs, but, but did we help get the message out? Did we help people take better care of themselves? That's expensive to find out sometimes, you know, because you can't do the research for the cost because we're not very expensive for what we do um, because we're so socially entrepreneurial driven. Um, yeah. So, so, for, so, so for us, that's really, um, really, really important. Um, so is the, end, is the end of it. Yeah. So I think entertain impact you've owned it for 18 years, something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you a tough question, which is like, which, which of your kids you like more, but of all the campaigns you've been involved with with entertain media, is there one that you 
very proud of? Um, you know, it's interesting. I always think that we win with the campaigns and we fail with the campaigns. So I'll give you a big, a big failure was we did a campaign for World uh, Animal Protection. It was about sloths and keeping these animals at home, even little tigers, the cubs, and then discarding them. And it turned out it was the same. We launched the day that there was that terrible shooting in Las Vegas. That's just bad mm -hmm. luck. You can't help. Nobody wanted to post on that. Ones that one, but uh, some of them you do some things well and you do some things not so well and you learn. And so we always do a wrap report for ourselves and for clients looking back. And I find that incredibly useful so that we can do better next time and learn. However, I'm fortunate that there have been many, many campaigns that we, and the we is not just me or my team at Entertain Impact who are brilliant, but it's a collective. You can't do things by yourself. It's the... Mm -hmm. It's the PR people, it's the communications people, it's the um, development people, the programmatic people around the world. So we've done some, some things that have just been uh, wonderful. Like, for example, we were very involved with Rotary and Gates and UNICEF on polio eradication around the world. Africa went um, polio free, India went polio free when we did the, the campaigns. And I can tell you, we, we would measure that in four, four tranches. We raised a certain amount of money, but it was directly attributable to us. We were involved in raising money through Gates, the world, uh, the Gates Global Vaccine Conference in Abu Dhabi that raised about $5 billion. That's not us. We're just a small part of it. We engaged Rotary's 1.3 million members and we got them more enthusiastic. That's definitely our 70 different ambassadors that we had. You know, Desmond Tutu, Itzhak Perlman, Ziggy Marley, Angelique, plenty of people, you know, each aimed at different. Mm -hmm. uh, funders or aimed at populations you know we had the Bollywood actors aimed at getting mums and their husbands to allow the mums in rural um, India to go get vaccinated so and then the big thing where we're a grain of sand on the beach because this has been going for many 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 years since the 60s and many many people have given their lives unfortunately in the Taliban areas um, but you know UNICEF's and the governments so we can't take any credit for that we're just a grain of sand on the beach when Africa and India went and put it free. So I think it's important to recognize where you've contributed, but never to over overstate it. Understate yes. it is, is usually better. So yeah, so we've had lots of campaigns. You can go on Entertain Impact's website. There's lots of case studies. And in the book, you know, the book is really a, a, a punctuation point for me. Yeah, I want to give away as much of the knowledge as I possibly can because so, I want so to have... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me set this up for you. Then yes. uh, you wrote a book called Good Influence. Uh, yeah. And for my research, I don't think there's anything like it out there. Something that that takes a deep dive into something in, into a topic that's very hard for everybody. But I'm you know, I'm I'm a marketeer by by profession. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I'm a business yeah. coach. Um, yeah. In, influencer became the new shiny object in in marketing, mm -hmm. especially. Um, I want to I want to give you my two cents of what I think has happened to that term, and then you're gonna beat me up and tell me no, you're wrong, which is which is good because that's why you're here. But yeah. uh, your your book is 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 really a roadmap to how to properly use influencer, and so. I'm going to give you my, my two cents on influencers. Again, this is for my own universe of small business world, right? Um, once upon a time, there used to be people that wrote blogs about topics of, of interest to them, and they wrote honest opinions, and they've accumulated a significant amount of a tribe followers behind them because they like their sincerity and they like their how they share things. And one day somebody said, oh, let's call him an influencer. And with that term came monetary rewards for, hey, could you talk about my, can you review my thing for X amount of dollars because you have 100,000 followers, right? So I think what happened was there was a fine line in the sand for me of the sincerity of the, I'll call them the old bloggers yeah. to cross crossing the line into now they're called influencers. And yeah. yes, there's still an aspect of sincerity in influencers who, in your case, celebrities who believe in the cause, whether it be diabetes, mm -hmm. cancer, or saving animals. Mm -hmm. But 
it's like everything else, it, everybody's jumping into the influencer pool and now it gets all muddy. And I think your book, and I was curious, I, I, the, the thing that jumped at me about your book was the first that you, it, it, the, the word good is part of the title, right? Yeah, so yeah, that's important. Let's talk about that. I, I actually want to start with the title. Why did you pick the word good as opposed to? Because, because I feel that, um, and this may be just my personal philosophy, um, that most people, if you put something in front of them that's real and credible, and credible is important, um, and sincere, as you put it, that they will react well. And in my case, all my stuff is social mission. Even my music, it, you know, the companies that I work with and the movies that I work with, um, like Made in Memphis Entertainment, which is a black owned black run company for BIPOC to give BIPOC folk an opportunity. All my stuff is social mission driven. So for me, I've seen the power that musicians, actors, business leaders have to influence people. So we all influence people. We influence our family, teachers influence us. But I'm talking about somebody who is a public figure that, you know, that, that can have an influence on a desired audience or stakeholder. Um, and it could be an athlete, but it might be um, it might be an icon. I mentioned, I mentioned Desmond Tutu before, the late Desmond Tutu, someone like that. Um, so for mine, it's a much broader thing. And you know, definitely, you can pay someone to do something, and I, I have no problem with that. If it's if it's very direct, hey, I'm pitching this car, this telephone, and you know exactly what they're doing. If it's if it's um, you know hidden, and I think there are a few. There's a case that recently came out on the, I think, selling uh, cryptocurrency. I may have got this wrong, but I think Lindsay Lohan yeah. and a few other people mm -hmm. were about to be charged if they weren't already charged because they didn't. They they gave the impression they were doing it for nothing, and they weren't. They were getting paid for it. So I think honesty is a very important thing. The people I work with, and the reason I have good influence is because all my clients are have a social initiative, philanthropy, social justice. And all of them do it for nothing. And why do they do it for nothing? Because it's um, it's credible. They're authentically connected. They're passionate about it. So, so if I'm if I'm doing something um, with uh, with a musician um, on polio, like it's how it's how has, has unfortunately has polio. He's connected with it. It's something he's. It's really important. If we're doing something on education, um, you know, our influences will. You know, maybe their mum was a, or dad was a, was a, was a, uh, was a teacher. There's an authentic connection. That's why the research is so possible. Uh, it's so important, rather. And, and what, what's interesting is the book itself comes in three, three sections. Section one, which is only one chapter, and it's very much an engaging kind of book that you can dip into and come back to. The first part is saying, why is the influencer effect so important? It's because it reaches your audiences that you can't reach normally. That Advertising doesn't reach often, the brands don't reach, and within the COVID environment, we've become very fickle. We're not brand loyal in the same way that we were, and this is a very economic way of getting to the right people. So that's the first part. The next chapter, two to six out of seven chapters, is how do you do this? So I want to infuse the knowledge, but also the confidence to whether it's a small arts organization or it's a small you know, for-profit business, anyone can do this. So when I, when I reach out to some of folks who are um, you know, very, very well known in their field, whether it's medical field or a Lima where we're dealing with kind of you know, um, oxygen for Africa during COVID, or whether, whether it's um, you know, the Elmer Philanthropist Music Group and we're reaching out to musicians like uh, BB Rexa. I don't know them. You know, I've obviously got lots of experience now in doing it, but anybody can do it if they do the research they know how to contact people and the book tells them exactly how to do that. Not just in the way you read it once, but there's an index that really says, oh, what's the ask letter that we have to read, to, 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 to write rather, to get to send. And there's an affiliated website. It's uh, goodinfluencebook.com. I have templates, free templates that people can use. Um, so that it's really a how-to. How, how do you design your action plan? How do you do your research? How do you engage the influencer? How do you activate them? How do you measure your success? And then yeah. the last bit, which is 10 pages, is just about this idea of popular culture, more academic, you know, more 
cause influences the field that I'm trying to build, the use of popular culture stuff to change. So, so anyone and, can and, do and, it. Yeah, and, and I gave you my my two cents on what I think transpired on the business, the, the non-social justice, non-philanthropic yeah. uh, uh, universe of using influences. I think for, for many of the people that listen to my podcast with small business owners and entrepreneurs, yeah. everybody needs to and wants to grow their business and and they're all desperately looking for anything called shiny object something that the return on investment can lead to growth and so yeah. I, th that's the piece that bothers me with the whole influencer concept in that realm not the stuff that you do i think that the message from you is that influencer from a tactical standpoint is an absolutely critical part of how you can get your message out but at least for me and that's my own interpretation you don't do this for for purposes of sell uh, ultimately selling something you can indirectly you can mm -hmm. indirectly benefit from awareness of your brand if you have the right influencer who connects with your audience have something yes. in common but if you go pay somebody that has 300,000 followers and and they're very expensive on the business side, right? Um, to me, it's you, you, it's a shortcut, but it it lacks the genuine and the honesty that comes across from you as saying, look, if if they share something with our audience that we ask them to represent. Well, right? Yes, and I, and I think you can trip over that. And the book talks a little bit about how not to trip over that, and it gives examples. So let me give you the kind of the big corporate example, which is Nike. Nike. Yeah. You know, you can, you can, and I, you know, I do a lot of academic research to back up what I'm talking about. Um, but Nike, for example, for example, their um, stock, you know, you have lots of examples of stock price staying higher, revenues increasing when you use an influencer, right? On a much smaller business level, there's there's a shirt company, for example, that that sent its shirts out to some some on air at uh, at one of um, the, the the distribution. Like the channels, like M MSB, yep. MBC, and they liked it. They used it. It went on air, and then you saw a a big leap. There's a company in California, Casts with a Z, that sent that the, the lady was created a kind of a colorful cast for a kid when when it uh, when the, when the, when the kid hurt themselves. She then sent them out to a few celebs for no money. Nobody took equity of the business or anything. They loved them. They showed them on TV. Boom! She now has a six million dollar business. It's the authenticity if you find the right person and it's real because mm -hmm. millennials and below, they have a BS meter. They know if they're being sold and it's not authentic. And there's a lot of research that says most, most um, of that generation will want to work for a company, stay at a company and buy from a company that does social good. So I, my big thing is if you're a company and you're trying to get business and grow your business, you, you can use influencers just make sure they're the right ones for your company and you treat them respectfully. It's not just a product and you're not just using them. You know, it has to be a yeah. long-term relationship. So I think that's really important. But if you're in a small market, it could be your local newscaster. It could be, you know, there's plenty of people who um, live in, live, you know, maybe very well-known or not so well-known that live in, that live in, you know, your town or your area. So I, I think, I think that's, um, that's very, very important is to have, have, have the right people and, 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 and to foster a long-term relationship. So, mm -hmm. But I, I think if you do it authentically, you can do that. And I think we can divide the, the world into the philanthropy side. We're going to do it for nothing. There's the commercial side. I'm going to charge you to do it. But again, you need to have the right connection, research, research. And you'll find a lot of this on the website and in the book uh, with examples like grids, with real examples. And it's not just about social followers. It's about what's your interest, you know, which, who, what's your family history, who you involved with, you know, do the research and you'll find the right person for you. And there's this middle ground, what I call cause marketing. Uh, well, not I call, but everyone calls it cause marketing, where it's kind of half philanthropy and half business. And that's really productive for everybody. That's a win, win, win. Um, so if you yeah. can do what I call a multi-pack, which is a business, a social initiative and an influencer, there's huge benefits to that. And I and there aren't enough of those being done. Um, you know, one of the ones which is a bigger version is with Matt Damien, who founded water.org and Stella Artois, the, the beer company. 
where they did this whole thing where if you bought these, you know, six glasses for 15 bucks, the money went to water.org. And they raised, I think, $8 million in water for three, three million people over this six or seven year period. But what was really cool from a Stella Artois viewpoint, and the CMO said this, um, it made us hip. It got us to a younger audience. And I think it, on every scale, whether you're a small business or you're medium sized, anywhere in the world, if you use influencers correctly, and I don't even like the word use, you work with, right. I think it's much more a mutual, yeah. mutual dialogue, then I think you can really help get your, get your um, product or your service out there so that people will make their minds up. And you have to be genuine. That's the real key. You have to really don't yeah. sell people BS. Um, yeah, well, it, that, it, that, look, really it, important. Uh, and, and I'm so glad I'm, I'm letting you speak because to me, this is like what you're talking about is a reality mm -hmm. check for my yeah. audience of business owners and entrepreneurs because uh, yeah. yes, you, you risk everything to start a business and you deserve to make money and grow. But yeah. there has to be there has to be something more than just the the money piece. And that's when I talk to my clients and and people that I speak with, I said, so what do you believe in? What what yeah. is it? What well, we use the word cause? What cause do you believe in? Well, yeah. I'm, you know, whatever, cancer, child, childhood cancer. Okay, so what are you doing about it? Okay. Just putting it on your website is is it work, you know, talk is cheap and words are cheapless even even less cheap so are you doing anything about it because to me in listening yeah. to you it's a sort of indirect way to you know you said the, the combo pack right the four the for profit the, you know you you don't pay yeah if you have a cause and as a business you actually sincerely support that cause then you can find someone within a community that's an influencer do something and yeah. yeah, it might just be brand awareness. You're not going to sell widgets or something. And and you should never expect to sell something out of it. Well, no, right? that that's I mean, I think you'll attract people to your business. Exactly. Uh, but we do but we do measure. We do ROIs, we do SROIs, social return on investments, and we see very economic returns from a financial mm -hmm. viewpoint because nonprofits are, you know, have to run as a business. So we see we see really great returns at much more economic rates than saying doing advertising by working with, uh, with with influencers, even if you pay them. And in this yeah. course marketing world, you pay them you know, maybe much, much less if at all than, yeah, than if you do it, genuine yeah. marketing. I yeah. mean, there's ways to do with that influencers where, where the cause is part of your business model. For example, Bombas, who is the sock company that yes. was founded by Shark Tank. I bought their socks because they donate a pair to a homeless shelter for every pair you buy. Now. Do they actually do this? I'm going to assume that they do. Have I they seen? Do, they do. A friend yeah, of mine right? works there. They absolutely yeah. do. And, it's the, and, Tom, and it's so, the Tom's shoes. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I believe in that. So, so Paul, interestingly, I mean, I, I wrote two books. I'm a, I'm a little guy. Nobody knows me. But I but I remember, you know, for each one of the books, particularly the, my, my last one, um, I spent a lot of time picking out the quote that's going to be sitting alone on that blank page because right. it meant something. It meant a lot to me. It it represented a part of me that I wanted to share, either on the topic of the book or me. So I'm going to read the one you picked. I the picked, one you picked. There's two. Okay, go on. Yeah. Uh, so the one, the one I may I pick because I liked it. Of we're course. all going to we're all going to die. We don't yeah. know when. And yeah. now is an excellent time to learn the piano. Ancient Buddhist saying. Why'd ish, you pick ish, ish, ish? Yeah. Okay. Why'd you pick that? Well, I didn't pick it. It's actually my I made it up, but it comes from oh, a really? Buddhist. <laughs> yes, it comes from a that's why it says ish in brackets around it. So okay, I, 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 my 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 um I've been um you know following the Buddhist tradition for uh, several decades at, the, at this point, and that's an adaption of a Buddhist saying. But the point being, um, and I, and in the book, this is the same the same message I'm trying to get across is we can talk about things a lot but you have to go and do something. And so we, and you never know how much time you've got in the world. And so now's as good a time as any to get moving and, and get on with it. And with, with influences or whatever part of your business that you want to want to grow, assuming you're healthy and you know life is okay, um, get going because uh, there's a lot of stuff I look back on and said, oh God, I wish I'd done that three or four years ago. Now I may, may have not had the knowledge three or four years ago in the same way I do now, but I but but that's the, the reason for the quote is, is to get, 
get moving in the book has a has a has a quote from Lat Sal that says, you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. But the book is the GPS that you need these days to help you help you get get there in the influencer world. So yeah, mm. get going. Amazing confidence and knowledge. Um, so you you write in your book, and I'm mm -hmm. quoting. Yet, despite yeah. interacting with celebrities, my heroes are the unsung and unknown folks doing essential philanthropic relief, international development, and social justice work near and far from home. One influence in popular was Jane Ortner, a school teacher who died too young, and whose yeah. eulogy eulogy was a wake up call for me to do more for others. What was that wake up call? I mean, you've been doing philanthropy for so many years. Well, she Jane. Uh, this is many decades ago she died very oh, she okay. a teacher she was a teacher and then and then um and and i thought to myself you know what is what do i want my obituary to look like i can i guess it's re reverse engineering your life and i like helping people i believe in people and i thought you know i have all this experience and these connections let's do some do some good with it um which sounds a little kind of naive and maybe it was but but i thought i could use this entertainment background that i have to, to really to really help help people and then the other thing I mentioned earlier TJ Martel the cancer research um, organization I was at one of their dinners and there was a guy on the stage who was the American ambassador but the medical ambassador to the UN in Geneva he was in the next bed to TJ he survived and he used his life for good and I thought ah, it's not going to be rude on your podcast but kind of yeah let's go let's go and do something instead of sitting here so those those were two and then I and then in terms of the heroes, I just want to mention, um, for example, through Elma Flanders, I work with a hospital for young children in Haiti. And there's a, there's a priest there, uh, Father Rick, who went over there 30 years ago to open an orphanage, saw how bad the, um, the uh, mortality rate, how high the mortality rate was, stayed there, became a doctor, opened a hospital in a rickety old hotel. Now it's the best hospital, I think, in, in Haiti. Um, it's, and now there's 400 Haitians who run it, and it saves many, many lives of the poorest uh, in, in Haiti. He's my hero. Those folk are my, my heroes, kind of the unsung ones. So I'm just grateful to, 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 to be with them and to learn from them and to help if I can. I mean, I have other heroes because I know you sometimes ask these questions at the end. I mean, I have the Paul Robesons and the Ganders, but, mm -hmm. but the people I've been just so fortunate to, to be associated with, like, you know the father ricks or alima who work in work in africa um in ways that i could, could never do but they're not necessarily great marketers because they're doing the work and so that's where i can add value so that's yep. that's that's kind of where i come from on that yeah so i i kind of want to summarize this this mm. beautiful conversation and thank you for being who you are because i think uh it, it gives it, i i feel energized that there are people out there who who do good things um and not for selfish reasons for sure and you know the one lesson the one thing i've always taught my kids was that life is a balancing act right uh it th this is what it's about it's a you know one it, it can't be this way we try our best and and to kind of summarize what you're talking about about influencers i kind of look at it also as a balancing act where you can balance the um paid for with the unpaid for in using influencers in a way the comic source connects with your audience but is genuine and caring and it's okay to pay for it but it still has to be the genuine right and there's to be a connection with the people that you're trying to reach and communicate with otherwise why go through all this effort why bother life's life's too short as my quote said and right. and if you and if you can do some good at the same time, it's going to grow your business and it's going to grow your social impact. That's why the subtitle of the book is How to Engage Influencers for Purpose and Profit. They're not, yeah. they're not separate. You can do both. Yeah. yeah. So I have a couple of rapid questions. I didn't send them to you in advance. Usually I do, but I forgot. But you're the kind of guy that's going to spit them out quickly. Um, Maybe. These are like one yeah. word things. So one person that influenced you in life, not business. My uncle, Sir Alexander Samuels, who told me, um, he didn't actually told me, set an example. He never interrupted somebody if they were speaking. And the amount of information you lose if you interrupt somebody, which I'm impatient and I tend to do that, but I try not to, um, is incredible. So listen, that was, 
my uncle Alex. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting how we 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 have to come back to learning how to communicate because the tools we have at our disposal today are interrupters all the time. And somebody I forgot his name just wrote a book, SFTU, and it's about listening. And the SFTU is shut the f up this is this is the title of the uh, book but but right. this is somebody who's who's very very successful all right this is this is perfect for you and then one more after that if you had okay. a billboard in times square what would paul katz put on it um maybe the quote the the the, the, the buddhist quote the, that the I piano, that I the piano quote. yeah i think so, so I, because it, because it's kind of humorous but it has meaning at the same time and it's hopefully gets people we can all talk. And I think there is a very big value in being empathetic and understanding people. But I think there's a value in taking action. Yeah. yeah. Um, last one, looking at your, clearly uh, your career and the people that you were hanging out with and got to work with um, is, is really phenomenal. When you look back, what is one thing you cherish the most about your career? Um that it was guided by passion and not financial or other gain. I think that's really my guiding, my North Star, I think they call it. Um, and just, have I been lucky, you know? I've been so lucky. So mm -hmm. so part of, part of what I, um, I do is just see how much um, mentorship and giving back I can do for people who have got much brighter than me. Sometimes they don't have the opportunities. That's all. They need those opportunities and economic ownership, um, as well as education and everything. And so I think you. I think that's that's been a pleasure for me, uh, as much as anything. Yeah. And look, it's amazing. And look, we're we're both Jewish, and it's I think it's part of our 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 DNA to do the things that you're doing and you've dedicated your life to. Right. Uh, you know, we we can go and 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 do some what we call tzedakah and give somebody some money that's nah, it maybe it's a feel good for a moment it's not the same you you have a long career of doing good for different causes uh and and i love the fact that you did that it, it was you wasn't motivated by greed it was motivated by no the, a chance to not. make a chance to make a difference and and, and you know just to, 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 to add something the next stage of my career because i'm not really you know, I have friends of mine who are sculptors and artists they're not retiring it's a manifestation of who they are their art for me the next stage of my career is really talking about how i can give away the knowledge that i have so that i can kind of um have other people do more of it that's really what i'm going to be concentrating on for the next few years yeah and and i never promote anything on my podcast to stay genuine and honest but I do have to yeah. say because influencer is such an important topic for 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 profit and especially for non for profit. Um, don't make the mistakes. Go read Paul's book because it's a it's a it's a roadmap of how to do things right, and you don't have to compromise the profit piece. You can still do it as you you know eloquently pointed yeah. out. There's a there's a there's a fine balance, but the key is. Sure. Do your homework and connect with the right people, and then it works out. So, uh, Paul, I am humbly thankful for someone like you uh, uh, spending an hour with me. Uh, I, I mean it. And uh, I will include your book and how to connect with you in my show notes. But it's been, it's been truly a pleasure. And thanks again. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. And for your, uh, your listeners or viewers, uh, I'm very happy to have a dialogue. Uh, about about this if it's helpful to them so yeah very yeah. cool